Hi, welcome to Gallery Profile. Gallery Profile is something that we're doing new uh, during coronavirus to kind of help the galleries stay visible and to uh, talk about some of the things that they have available in case you happen to be a potential buyer. You might be somebody who could pick up the phone and call one of these galleries and, um, and then uh, support them because everybody needs support during this period of time. My name is Eric Rhodes and I am the publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazines. And now I'm on the screen and welcome to Lance Rays. Welcome, Lance. How are you? Thanks for having me, Eric. I appreciate what you're doing and helping us, uh, you know, get the word out that we're still doing business. Absolutely. Well, nothing, nothing stops, you know, or at least it shouldn't. And yeah, so absolutely. I, I think I first met you, you were, you were probably still a teenager. Um, I remember coming into the gallery. As a matter of fact, there's a, I'll tell you the story. There's a momentous day that your, your gallery had a lot to do with. Um, I had been visiting your dad, Howard, and uh -huh. of course, your dad is still very involved in, in the gallery. Absolutely. And your grandfather was there and probably your mother and your sister. And you were, I think, just going into college, if I remember correctly, or maybe just still in high school. Okay. And I left that day and I was walking down the street and I was walking down. What is the street, the big street, the Sony building is on? Do you remember what that would be? Sony the building. Madison, maybe? Okay, yeah, yeah. That's right on the corner there. So right, right under there, right in that area was the uh, Dehesh Gallery. And I had met Peter Trippi, who was the director of the Dehesh Gallery uh, at a cocktail party. So I'm walking from a meeting at your place to another meeting and I see the Dehesh. And so I thought, I'll stop in and say hello to Peter Trippi unannounced. And that uh, conversation ended up with him being hired as the editor of the publication. That's been 11 or 12 years. Interesting, I didn't realize it was, uh, it was at that point, interesting. Yeah, so you guys, you guys, if I hadn't been at your gallery, I would have never stopped. Wow. So Lance. That's very interesting. Uh, so what, uh, just to, to give a, a general feel, um, what is the impact of coronavirus and the quarantine on your business? Are you still hearing from customers? Is everything yeah, so, just... I mean, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, we've been closed. We closed earlier on. We're, we're based in New York City. So um, we've been closed for almost a month now. Um, I would say in the first few weeks, um, we were sort of still getting our footing and trying to figure out exactly how things were going to go and how right. long it was going to last and if it was going to be a long-term shutdown or, um, you know, there was just so, so many mixed messages coming out. Uh, we didn't really know what to expect. Um, but at this point now, things actually seem to be happening so that's a good thing um you know um i'll talk a bit later on about some of the events that we have going on um but we have we have sold work so i'm happy to say that oh you know, that's great news and, you know at the end of the day people are, are stuck in their homes so um you know there's only so much you can you can take looking at the tv uh you want to change <laughs> it up what you have on your walls and where are the people to come to if you want to do that absolutely and and you know it's interesting because um a lot of us automatically assume that uh, people stop spending at a time like this, but we have to remember that there are a lot of people who have jobs who are still continuing. They may be stuck at home, but they have jobs, they have incomes. Uh, and of course, even during the Great Depression, which was much worse than this, uh, the Great Depression, there were still people spending money. And I remember during uh, the 2008 recession, another art dealer there in New York. I know there are no other art dealers, but assuming there was one, <laughs> um, another art dealer said to me, well, you know, people are still spending money. Surprisingly, they may not be spending, they may not be buying half million dollar paintings, but they're still buying paintings. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, that says that it's, it's always, there's always opportunity. And of, of course, there's opportunity for buyers too, I would imagine. Well, the other, the other interesting thing that we're sort of dealing with right now is that this is, while it ultimately is going to be a major economic impact on the country there, like you said, there are a lot of people still working. I have a ton of friends that, that are working full time. It's all digital. They're working from home and they're, you know, doing these kind of meetings over zoom and stuff, but um, they're, they're still getting, they're still getting paid and they're still kind of living life, even if they're restricted to their home. So. Well, in your particular case, I would imagine, or your gallery's case, is you guys don't get paid unless you sell something. So we hopefully some people will see some work that they like and and maybe buy something. Yeah, hopefully. We'll see. Yeah. So Lance, <laughs> I ask you to prepare a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Um, 
and, and maybe we can kind of pull that up and then we can sure. kind of talk about some of the different things that we see in, in the images there. Yeah, absolutely. Give me one second. Just yep. All good. Okay, so uh, first thing I have a question about is there's yeah. what's the difference between Ray's Contemporary and Ray's Galleries? Well, sort of Ray's Galleries is the umbrella corporation of it all. Um, so we're in one physical space. Um, that said, we sort of operate a smaller segment of the gallery um, showing contemporary artists. Um, Ray's Galleries is traditionally known for 19th century European paintings at this point. Um, so this is sort of an offshoot of that, continuing, a lot, continuing on a lot of those academic traditions of 19th century paintings, but um, being done by contemporary artists today. And, and are you, um, are, are you the one who kind of started this contemporary thing or was that something um, that... I mean, to be honest, um, my, I would say my dad more so got involved with, with some contemporary artists even as long ago as the 1980s. Um, it wasn't a huge portion of our business at that point. Um, and then in the, around 2010, I would say, uh, my dad started looking for some contemporary artists to expand what we were showing at the gallery. Um, my sister and I came into the gallery a couple years after that, and we really started to build the roster of contemporary artists to be its sort of own standalone gallery. So there is, um, there, there's a double meaning to the word contemporary, um, and that always tends to confuse some people. So contemporary could be just meaning a living artist. So someone who is living today and painting would be a contemporary painter but That's also contemporary can also designate a style, um, a contemporary sure. style, if you will. H how do you categorize yourself? So yeah, so I mean, I look at contemporary in, in the former uh, definition that you had there, um, which would be just artwork being done by artists that are alive today. Um, it can be in a style that's very traditional. It can be in a style that's very modern or very cutting edge, um, but at the end of the day, if they're living, that's, that's how I look at it. I think there are a lot of really talented artists that may be painting things in a very traditional manner. And those artists deserve to be shown um, very much on the same platforms as other contemporary artists that are doing work today. When I was last up there, I think I was in New York uh, over the summer uh, with my son. We had uh, come to pick up my father who was visiting New York. And uh, we came by the gallery, and there was a show on at the time with um, uh, uh, Ken Celez. Yeah. And, and, uh, and Ken had selected, or you guys had selected, artists who were his contemporaries. Uh, and I remember, it seems yeah, so to me, with, with several. Ken, with Ken's show, he, uh, he had a book that launched around the same time, and he invited a number of the other artists that were featured in the book to participate as well. Um, yeah. So that was well, and you have you have a show going on now. I think you'll pull up the slide. You have somebody else who just released a book, which is a, a one of the nicest, most fabulous books that I've seen on on art. Yeah, Todd Casey. Yeah. Absolutely. So why don't we go ahead and and uh, let's go through some of your, your yeah yeah of uh, course slides. I'm just gonna kind of give uh, give everybody a little bit of history about the gallery and uh, then we'll get into some of the art that we have and oh, that's great. We'll go from there. Um, so just to introduce the family. Um, currently, that we all work at the gallery. Uh, it's myself, my mother, my sister, and my father, uh, Howard, Amy, and Alyssa. Um, we're actually the, I'm the fourth generation in the gallery. My father will be the third. Um, my great grandfather started the gallery back in the 1930s. Um, and initially, he was actually an accountant. He, uh, he had never envisioned himself getting into the art world. Uh, and he had a number of friends that that were in the, got involved in the antiques trade and they were dealing mostly in furniture and we're really pushing him to get involved in that as well. And it really wasn't for him, um, but he went, he went over to Europe and he sort of fell in love with paintings and that's sort of where it all started. And he started importing paintings back in the late 1930s. Um, and as that progressed through the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, we actually became the leader um, of importing European paintings into the United States. Um, I believe at the peak, it was around 2,000 paintings a month. And it was, really? more, it was more wholesale. Um, we were supplying department stores, other galleries with their inventory. 
Um, so it was more of a warehouse space, galleries stacked up all around. Um, and from, from the stories I've heard, it was, it was oftentimes uh, quite a scene, a lot of madness, people fighting over paintings. And Well, I would, do you have any names of some of the, the artists that your grandfather would have imported? Oh, because I would um, imagine there were some pretty important ones. Off the top of my head, I mean, it was, I honestly couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't tell you. I know that my dad often, often mentions a story uh, about Frederick Morgan that, that came through the gallery, I believe it was in the 50s. Um, that we we turned around and sold for for just a few hundred dollars, and uh, around the year two thousand, I think it popped up at auction again and sold for close to a million. So I mean, wow. there were there was quite a bit of work that came through, and the price points when you hear them today, it's just sort of well, mind boggling. Well, one thing I I've got to say, I got to give your dad credit. Um, you know, your dad has impeccable taste. I I don't know, maybe your mom picks them, but whoever <laughs> whoever picks them, you, you know when. I'm a big fan of the 19th century, 18th century kinds of things, and and uh, but also the contemporary artists and and everything in that gallery that I've ever seen has always been really, really special. Well, thank you. Yeah, my dad does most of the curating for the 19th century. Um, he's been doing it for uh, I think it's about 40 years now. Um, he came right into the business out of college, and it's, it's all he's known. So it's something that he loves, and it sort of comes through. Uh, just as you said, and the quality of the work that we show and sort of what, what catches his eye and what, what, we, what we buy. You know, it's very unusual that a gallery has survived from the 1930s. The, uh, there probably are not very many in America or probably even in the world that have survived sure. that long. What, what do you think is the reason your gallery has survived? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're really, really focused on the quality of the work that we show. Um, you know, we're very, very particular about the things that we buy, things that are in good condition, are the best works of the artist. And then I think on top of that, something that sort of differentiates us from other galleries is our accessibility. Um, I think we're a bit more personable. I think, um, unfortunately, from my personal experience, what I've seen is a lot of people are intimidated to interact with galleries. And I think the family aspect that we that we have and the way that we nurture our relationships with our clients. You know, that's a that's a huge thing. Um, I, I hear another voice in there. Howard, are you on? Yeah, I think he's in there. <laughs> Howard, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah we can you. Oh, good. Well, everybody, this is Howard Rays, and this is Lance's <laughs> Lance's dad. So, Howard, um, maybe you can answer that question about how. How is it that you guys have survived since the 1930s? Hmm. I think what my son said was probably got it pegged right. We really are very particular uh, with the type of works we buy and the quality and the condition. And we've built a reputation for, you know, looking for the finest of any artist's work. I yeah, and, and I think that's a that's really an important distinction because uh, there were even, I, I think, people who might not know this uh, that that might be viewing, and that is that uh, there were even famous artists who ended up their work, their worst work, ended up in the market. Sometimes with signatures, sometimes without. Oftentimes, you know, there are artists uh, like myself. I'm certainly not famous, but the idea is. I have stacks and stacks of paintings that I've done that were that I would consider to be dogs that if I had become famous, somebody, you know, when I pass away, somebody might go in there and reach out and, you know, take the, the stuff I never wanted published or never wanted sold and sell it, you know, which happens in estates. And so why is it important that you get the best of the best? Can you articulate that, either of you? Well, you I, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, for us, or at least for me, I'm one that doesn't believe in, quote, buying a signature. I think you have to buy the quality of the work first. So whenever I, I look at a, at a painting that's being offered to us, I'm not too concerned about who the artist is at the beginning. I just want to know that it's a great work of art. In my, in my opinion, it's a great work of art. And then when I do a little more research, if I'm not that familiar with an artist, I want to make sure that the particular painting would rank among the top 10% of whatever that artist produced. I'm, I'm very much against, quote, buying signatures. And I write about that, you know, repeatedly. You have a, 
you have a blog that you do on a pretty regular basis. Is that right? Right. And we have a newsletter uh, that goes out once a month on the art market. And we are up to volume 232. So okay. we haven't missed a month since we started. They're excellent. Well, you know, I, before we go on with the rest of what's on this slide, Lance, um, yeah. I think this is a good time for either of you to answer this question. There are a lot of people, first off, you mentioned the intimidation factor. I, I have a friend who is literally a billionaire, and we were talking about art one time. He said, you cannot get me in an art gallery. He said, those people are the biggest snobs. He said, I am intimidated to go yeah. into art galleries. No, no, so, sure. It's very true. It's unfortunate. And I think, um, I think the, the industry sort of does it to itself. It sort of does it to keep people out and give this aura of prestige and importance. And um, it's just unfortunate. I think art should be appreciated by everybody. So. Well, yeah. and oftentimes, you know, the, the, when, when I first got into this, I was very intimidated to go into art galleries. I'd go in and they'd look you up and down and make you feel like you don't belong. And, you know, they didn't know whether or not I could, I, I could buy a painting. I remember talking to another dealer in New York, and, and I had a meeting with him, and he said, see that guy that just left? I said, yeah. He said, he walked in here in shorts and sneakers and a T-shirt one day, and I thought, well, you know, I, he's probably just a guy off the street. I'm, I'm going to have to rush him out of here. He said he walked out of here with $400,000 worth of paintings. And he said, you just never know anymore. He said, not, not everybody dresses the part. No, you really don't. I think people sort of do it intentionally. They don't want to be bothered, especially if you're going to a gallery and you do have money. You don't want to walk in there in a suit and attract attention and get, you know, all the salespeople all over you. You may just want to mind your own business and do your thing. But at the same time, when you do that, you get, um, there's a lot of assumptions made about you by, by many galleries. And like I said, it's just unfortunate that your, the quality of service you get then suffers. And I just, I just think uh, it's a bad thing for the art world overall. Um, well, the other, the other piece of that is that, you, you know, a lot of people can afford work that's in an art gallery. I, you know, one thing that, that a lot of galleries, you know, I can walk in there and find something that I can afford there. I, maybe I can't afford the, you know, some of the top, top, top tier stuff, but sometimes sure. it's a smaller piece or, or something. And I, I think that a lot of people just don't go in because they assume that everything that's going to be on the walls is going to be, you know, multi-million dollar. No, that's, that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable sort of takeaway from it. And, and something else, you know, for us with respect to that is, Hey dad. Um, so one other thing with respect to, you know, the price point of things is that we try to cover the full range of price points. I mean, as we get, you know, deeper into the slides, I'll, I'll present a few works that are in the hundreds of dollars. Um, it's probably one of the more accessible artists that we work with. And we sell more of his work than, than I'm not even kidding, any other artists uh, dollar wise or, or quantity wise. Um, and, and the average price point is five, $700. Yeah, that's um, very reasonable. Very reasonable. Uh, let me ask another question while we're on this topic, and then we'll let you get back to your slides. Sure. The, um, a lot of people also are intimidated because they don't know anything about any of this. And uh, a, a lot of folks, you know, they like art, but they don't really know if they're buying something that's good or not good. And they don't really know how to establish uh, their, their uh, understanding of art and, and how, how can you help people? What, what do you do to help people too. through that? Yeah, no, I love this question. And, um, you know, I talk to people about this all the time. We do a lot of art fairs. So I sort of interact with sort of the average people that don't feel very confident in what they're looking at and sort of their own judgment. And what I tell everybody and even how I go about buying my own art, um, I just buy what I like. It's really as simple as that. Um, you know, something that resonates with you, if you think the quality is, is a good quality and you know it's a, it's a very personal thing so on one hand you know you should be going to galleries that are, are reputable that that have some sort of good reputation but at the end of the day if you like something and you want to live with it it's really as simple as that you should you should have it <laughs> so that's really how, that's should, how I about a lot of things most people most people think that buying art is an investment, but that's that's very few and far between, isn't it? I think that's sort of a side um, a side element to the entire the entire, th or at least it should be sort of a side thing to art because it's not what it's made for. It's made to be appreciated, enjoyed, um, and then you know if if you happen to buy 
a particular work of art and in 30 years it's worth more than you know good for you but that shouldn't have been the reason you bought it in the first place because you were hoping to make money on it um you know the the comparison i always give you, know, you say oh i'm going to spend five thousand dollars on a piece of art and i want to know that i can get my money out of it and sell it at some point you know that's that's how a lot of people think about it but you may go to a furniture store and buy a couch a leather couch for five thousand dollars and you and get a certain amount of enjoyment you sit on it every day and it's comfortable and um, after 10 years, it's worn out and you have to throw it out. And over those 10 years, you've gotten a certain amount of value from it. Just as I would argue for the $5,000 painting on your wall, you look at it every day and there's a certain amount of value that you get from it over your lifetime. I look at it very much the same as that. There's a certain amount of personal value. And then if perhaps, again, you sell something later on and you make money on it, great. But that, that really shouldn't be the the initial reason for buying art in the first place. Well, that's even so, you know, most, most people buy a car and they don't have, you know, that car loses value the minute it goes off the showroom floor, but that's not true for paintings. No, no, that's, that's a good comparison. Again, I mean, people buy cars. There are some cars that go up in value. Again, I don't think long-term many people initially buy their cars to make money on it, but some do and, you know, lucky for them. All right, so let's go ahead and finish this slide and then we'll go into some of the artwork. Yeah, sure. So um, just quickly going through here, um, over the years we've become established as a leader in, in academic paintings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my father is uh, one of the leaders in, in 19th century European paintings. Um, For the person listening to this, what's an academic painting? Um, well, Dad, you're here. You can go ahead and give us a... <laughs> A good, robust um, mission. I think the academic art really um, is artists who studied at the Royal Academy in England in the 19th century or the Ecole des Beaux Arts in, in France and painted in the tradition of artists like Bouguereau, um, Vibert, those kind of artists. Mm -hmm. But more, more realism as compared to the impressionist artists of those periods. Okay, terrific. Yeah, and then um, as my sister and I came into the business and, and we started branching into the contemporary artists, um, we tried to build the roster of artists that carried on a lot of those traditions that we were known for. Um, and that's sort of how we got started. A lot of the artists that we work with are more representational. They paint still lives or landscapes or figure paintings. Um, and then at this point now, we've sort of expanded that. Um, it's all representational, but it does include uh, artists that are a bit more uh, impressionistic in their style. Um, so it's, it's a bit more of a range, but at the end of the day, it's all representational. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, in the contemporary art world, there aren't many galleries that show this type of art. And I think they're all, I mean, there's plenty of really talented artists out there that deserve to be shown. Well, so, this, you're, you're actually, I, I think you're pretty early into it because I think there's a massive trend of people who are moving towards representational again. Uh, there's a lot of evidence. I won't get into that evidence right now, but I, I think, you know, there are, are not very many galleries across America that are doing it. And I think you're in the sweet spot. I think that this is, this is a good move. Yeah. And again, it's something that, that personally sort of resonates with us. And um, as I mentioned, there's not many galleries doing it. I think they're underrepresented. So it's, it's a, it's a great way for us to sort of give a platform to these artists. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna kind of go through a few of the artists that we work with, just a small section. At this point now, we work with about 30, 34 artists, um, but just a small little cross section here, and I'll go through them quickly. Mark Legu, we started working with recently. Um, he's up in Canada, a bit more impressionistic, uh, paints cityscapes. Um, and what I sort of love about his work is the atmosphere and sort of how he brings you into the city. Um, it sort of has a busy feel to it. It makes you feel like you're on the street there in the scene. It captures um, the energy. Yeah, absolutely. And just the way he uses color and how he builds the scene using these very, very loose brushstrokes. It's sort of difficult to tell when you shrink them down onto a computer screen, but you know, his, his works are pretty large. And when you see them in person, they're, they're really stunning and um, yeah, we, we really love working with Mark. Um, ben is a bit more of a tonalist painter, more realistic. Uh, he paints out in the Midwest, a bit more serene, um, sort of calming scenes. Um, yeah, I'm not, um, Tony South, who does a bit more imagined scenes 
um, paints hot rods and motorcycles. And they're kind of crazy, crazy pictures that yeah, he comes up with. But the detail that he puts into them. Um, Very talented. Yeah, yeah, no, it's incredible. And he's actually, he's one of the few artists we work with that was actually self-taught. So he's not, um, did not come through uh, an academic program or anything like that. But the quality of his work um, just is, is so apparent. Um, and when we saw them in person, my dad actually uh, happened to buy uh, the first work before we started working with him. Uh, and I believe it's just uh, just next to him in the kitchen there. Um, <laughs> yes, but, it is. It's yeah. right behind me. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. <laughs> so he, he bought that one. And when we got it here, uh, just the quality of it was so impressive. My dad said to him, you know, if you would be interested in continuing on, a, you know, in the same style of work and doing the same subject, you know, we'd love to work with you. And I believe that was in 2012. Um, so it's, it's been quite some time we've been working with Tony. Um, done very well. The worst part of, the, of working with Tony is that he paints so slow. It, he takes about four months to do a painting. Wow, so, so they're really get, valuable. If you can get one, you've got to grab yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't get too much material out of him, but they, they often go quickly. So if, uh, if you're lucky enough to see what's available, you know, move quick. Um, Julie Bell, uh, we've been working with for quite some time. And, and uh, the way we started working with her, I, I love this story too. Um, she was on our case for a few months trying to, to get representation. And at that point, we were sort of full, um, just in terms of our inventory, we didn't have a lot of space in the gallery. So we kind of kept pushing her off and saying, you know, not right now, thank you. But, um, and I think that went on for about two, two and a half months of email exchanges. And then one day, her and her husband, Boris Vallejo, who's a pretty well-known illustrator, uh, they, they walked into the gallery, um, I think with about eight paintings under their arms. And uh, it was sort of like a mandated presentation. <laughs> They're like, you're going to look at this painting. <laughs> um, and we were just blown away by the quality. I mean, she, she's really well known for her illustrative work. She's been um, an artist since the mid 80s, um, doing a lot of, of illustrative things. But in the early 2000s, she got into wildlife paintings. And that's sort of what she presented to us initially. And the, again, the quality of the work, it was just, it was, it was stunning. Um, yeah, spectacular. Sort of, we, so we, we started working with her at that point. And over the years, she sort of blended her, her love of wildlife painting and, um, and her, her illustrative side and this, this fantasy art that she does. And as you can see in this example here, um, it's really a striking image, the quality and the detail of it. Um, but it's sort of a crazy scene that you're looking at. Um, it's very contemporary, but technically speaking, it's sort of traditional. So it's this blending of, of the, the traditional art that we're known for, as well as moving into the, into the contemporary world. And, and this, then, art, this uh, other artist, it looks like maybe a Japanese artist? He is. Uh, this is one of the newest artists we started working with, uh, Mitsuru Watanabe. And um, what I love about his work is the art historical references that he sort of bakes into the compositions. Um, this one, um, Hieronymus Bosch, it's just absolutely crazy. When you see it in person, you're sort of going through the scene and every time you look at it, you sort of pick up something new. Um, but the way he goes about building his works and what I find so intriguing is um, he paints his daughters into these scenes and the way he envisions art, the art that we find so important, um, he sort of looks at it as it's, uh, revered and it's untouchable and he wants to bring it down to uh, the average person and make it accessible mm. so he paints his child into it and it's almost as if he's envisioning this as a scene you can go visit so he's done this uh, with Bosch um, we have another painting at the gallery now um, of his daughter walking through Rousseau's forest which um, is probably one of my favorite works of his and I think it sort of captures the essence of of what he's all about um, she's carrying a blue lotus flower in her hand, um, which is referenced from a different painting. And it almost gives the impression she's walking through the forest in its entirety, visiting the scene um, as if it's a real place. Um, so I, again, I just find his work, the quality is excellent, but the way he goes about creating these scenes, they're just so intriguing and they're so well done. And um, Well, I would imagine with the level of detail I see in this one that he's also one that's pretty hard to get a hold of because he probably can't crank out a, a, a bunch of paintings. Yes. This is not something that happens fast. Exactly. I mean, again, we just started working with him. We started showing his work just this year. 
Um, he's very, very well known in Japan. Um, he's had quite a bit of success in, at the auction, um, the auction world. And he's turned to us to help build his market in the United States. So yeah. that's what we're doing now. Yeah, grab those guys because that th those are going to be worth a lot of money from my so. lips, right? So, <laughs> okay, let's move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm just going to get into uh, a couple of the current exhibitions we have going on right now um, for, for everybody out there. We're, we're closed. We've been closed for about a month. Um, Todd Casey's show, we opened uh, just a few weeks before we shut down. Um, so that was an in-person exhibition that is now fully digital. And uh, Stuart Dunkel's show was actually supposed to open today, um, April 6th. Uh, so that obviously is not happening in person. And we've done, we've converted that over to completely digital. Um, so that's, that's up and live now on the website. I'm happy to report actually that uh, we've had quite a bit of sales uh, when we went live this morning. So as we were discussing earlier, people are certainly buying. Um, yeah, I think half the paintings are sold already. All right. I think you mentioned a few just, just sold as we were waiting to start this chat. Um, before, before that, I, I tallied it up. We were at 21 of the 45. So we're just yeah, about halfway there. That's pretty good when you consider we're in the middle of a, uh, what we're going through. So Exactly. And all these sales happened. Um, we started doing pre-sales for this show about a week ago with, uh, with some of his bigger collectors. And uh, it just opens to the general public today. Um, so I'll, I'm going to go through a bit of Todd's work, and then we'll get into some some Stu's work. And okay. Um, so again, as I mentioned, most of the artists we work with are, are academically trained in some capacity. So Todd has, has quite a bit of academic training. Um, ultimately, finished his studies at uh, Water Street Atelier, um, which, if you're familiar with, uh, is run by Jacob Collins, a very well-known artist. Um, the way Todd looks at art is that he's a visual storyteller. He builds these scenes um, uh, with objects, and he wants you to, to see this as if it's a, a, an actual place. It's not just a bunch of things strewn about uh, that he thought were interesting. This, he tries to rebuild an actual scene as if it existed. Um, he's heavily influenced by historical literature as well as his own personal experiences. And as I get through some of the works, you'll sort of see how those come, come to be. Um, this first one here, Death in the Afternoon, as I mentioned, he's heavily influenced by literature. So, so this is sort of a, a take on Ernest Hemingway's classic, Death in the Afternoon. And, and what you're looking at here is Todd's uh, take on what his desk may have looked like as he was working on one of his books. Um, center in the image there, you see uh, this drink, uh, which is actually also titled Death in the Afternoon. It was uh, come up with by Hemingway and it, um, it's, it's uh, an absinthe-based drink that he suggested to drink three to five of at a time, but that's, a, that's for another, another time. <laughs> um, but what, what I love about his work, you know, it's not, like, like I said, it's not just a bunch of random objects. He sort of built the scene to give you the impression that you're looking at, at a space that, that actually existed. Um, and then further on top of that, he is building these compositions in, in relatively intriguing ways, his use of color and the way it sort of draws your eye about his use of contrast between the white cube at the top of the scene um, on that very dark background sort of catches your eye. Um, even the red match, um, book of matches. And then even at the bottom where you see that, that fountain pen, he's chosen to lay it on top of a white page. Um, again, highlighting contrast and, and sort of bringing your eye throughout the work. Um, so while the quality is, is really excellent, there's a lot of thought that goes into it and just the, sort of the way that Todd builds his compositions they're really intriguing scenes. So. Well, and, and as an artist, and, and if people are watching this and, and don't really understand what they go through, I mean, this is, this guy is really experienced and talented. To be able to pull something like that off, that, you know, there's about 30 different lines of perspective in this. It's, you know, objects going in different directions. This is not an easy task. And then to make them look so strong and so realistic and pull the eye in and balance the colors, it is, it's really yeah, no, a again, wonderful Todd's, piece of work. He's, he's really excellent. There's a certain softness to it, but again, the detail that he puts into it, it's just, it's an amazing balance that he has. Um, so this, this is one of the works that's still available. Um, another work that we have available from his show, wow. uh, titled The Entomologist. Again, um, as I mentioned earlier, 
some of the way he builds his compositions are from personal experiences. So I was chatting with Todd about this particular work and kind of understanding how he came about it. And it was as simple as him walking out to his mailbox one morning. And he, as you can see in the forefront of this image, there's a small cicada bug uh, just to the left center. And he stumbled across this dead bug in his path. And um, just being the curious guy he is, he picked it up and was sort of examining it. And he actually brought it back to his studio and was looking at it. And it sort of sent him on this, um, this, this journey in his mind to uh, re-envision what an entomologist desk may look like. So an entomologist is someone that studies bugs. Um, so he went back into his studio and got a bunch of objects together and created this scene. Um, but again, it was sort of uh, a very organic process to how he came about it. The, so it doesn't have this, this backstory as robust as, as you know, something that's based in literature. It's a very personal and maybe a minute experience in your life. But um, the way he builds the compositions are, are very interesting. He sort of throws himself completely into them. Um, and I think that, that sort of translates into the work. Fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I'll just go through a couple more. So just wanted to show a little comparison here. So Todd does most of his work, small scale studies first. You can see on the right, it's a six by nine inch painting. Um, and then in a studio, he'll, he'll go and he'll fully render, you know, a painting. Uh, so that's a 20 by 30 inch painting. And when you see it in person, the, all the globes and all the details, just there's so much detail that he, he puts into it. Um, they're fully flushed out and the quality, the quality is just really another, another level. If I were the collector buying that, I would buy both because I think it, it would really be nice to hang the one next to the other and to, to be able to tell my friends, this is, this is the process. If you can look at, I mean, even the rendering on the, on the small study is pretty incredible, but then you see how much further he takes it. It, it would be really wonderful to have both of those pieces. I hope that, that whoever buys them doesn't separate them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the interesting things about him, that he makes those studies available and, and they're something that the collector can sort of buy. And it shows you that process. Um, I think it gives you a bit more insight to how Todd, how Todd goes about things. Uh, absolutely. Then, um, I'll get into uh, to our other show that we have ongoing right now, um, Stu Dunkel. Um, and we were supposed to open this show, as I mentioned today, um, in person. It was the largest collection of, of works by the artist that were going to be on display in one venue. Uh, so it was 45 pieces. And, and you already uh, sold half of them. Well, yeah. So as I mentioned, we, we, we sent out a little preview to some of his bigger collectors. Um, as, as I said earlier, they're, they're pretty small pieces um, and they're quite affordable. Uh, so we have some collectors that have purchased 20, 30 of them over the years. And we gave them a bit of a preview. Um, this is a, a lot of people were sort of expecting this show and, and waiting for it. So we wanted to give them first crack at it. And there were quite a few people that, that pulled the trigger on sales last week. And then, as I mentioned, when we opened this morning, uh, we actually had a flurry of emails uh, that we had to check. And um, I believe there was another eight, eight or so works that sold just this morning. So outstanding. Yeah, absolutely. So again, Stu is uh, another academically trained artist that we work with. Um, he's a bit more broad in, in the subjects that he paints. Um, I guess most of them would be still eyes, but the one sort of quirky, unique feature about Stu is that he, he paints this little white mouse into all of his paintings. Um, it was interesting, I was chatting with Stu, sort of how it came about, and he was really interested in just painting animals. Uh, he painted a lot of dogs and he wasn't selling them. <laughs> and um, if you're an artist, um, while you do want to paint things that you love, um, there's a certain aspect to that. At the end of the day, you're likely painting to, to feed yourself and you know, put a house over your head and, and all that good stuff. So um, he, he did this one painting uh, of a mouse and gave it to a gallery and it sold. Um, and he decided at that point he was going to start painting mice instead of dogs. And it's sort of become a hit. Um, Stu is one of our best-selling artists at this point. Um, I think that's because they're so personable. People can relate to them. Um, there's such a diverse mix of works that he does and sort of the objects that he incorporates. So right. people can relate to them pretty easily. And then, as I said, they're, they're small and affordable and that sort of makes them accessible to the average person, um, which 
as you were discussing earlier, is, is sort of a problem these days for the art world in general. Yeah, uh, very nice. So yeah, yeah some, of the, some of the pieces that we have available, um, <laughs> and you can just confirm that none of these are the ones that, that sold before we started this chat. Um, <laughs> so again, some of the smaller works, they're priced at a few hundred dollars. Um, and they're just sort of fun pieces. Um, well, they'll be gone like fast. Them. Say again? They'll be gone fast. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they will. You know, it's really funny. We, thousands uh, of people seeing this. We uh, we've been doing. Uh, we do about ten to twelve art fairs a year, and there are sometimes we'll, we'll we were bring ten, twelve of these to a show, and uh, this happened last year where a collector that came in saw them and bought them all on opening night, and we didn't have any more for the rest of the show. Um, and well, let that be a lesson, huh? <laughs> it was it was certainly a lesson, and, and this year we actually went ahead and we got uh, a whole special case, a carrying case made for Stu Dunkel, and and we can fit I think it's like thirty or forty pieces in there, and he gets his own little carrying case that goes to all the shows, and oh, nice. we do not run out of paintings of his anymore. Yeah, I um, could de I could definitely see how somebody could could uh, frame up a whole wall and and uh, how they'd have a lot of fun with that. Exactly, they're fun pieces. Um, they're they're really nice quality pieces. Um, just the presentation of them, and then again, you can sort of relate to them. If there's uh, you know a donut that you love, you love cookies or Oreos. Um, we actually sold out of the Oreo paintings that we had from this show, but um, he just sort of paints all these different little objects that are fun, and people connect with them. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so here's just a few more. A bit. These are some larger pieces. I guess more mid size, um, but they're larger for stew. Twelve by sixteens and eight by tens. And nice. again, they're just sort of fun pieces that that people can relate to, whether you're a coffee lover or or whatever it may be. Right. Um, you know, he references uh, in the second picture there the rabbit portrait. I think it's sort of a take on contemporary art, and, and yeah. uh, after Jeff Koons is rabbit, and um, so yeah, he just sort of runs the gamut in terms of of subject, and most people can find something that they connect with, and and that's sort of what I think art's all about. It's sort of finding something that, that resonates with you personally. And if you fill your home with things that you like, I think um, that that's sort of what art's all about. It brings, it brings some enjoyment, you know, into your home. Great. Terrific. Yeah, so do you yeah, have any more slides? Uh, no, that was, that was sort of all the, all the art that I had for you today. So if, uh, if there's anything that anybody saw that they liked, here's some contact info, you can reach out. Um, everything is available. And, and by the way, I should just mention, we're not charging you for this. This is just, we're trying to help everybody in the art world right now. This is, this is just a service where we thought would be a cool idea because we want you to stay in business because yeah, if you absolutely. stay in business, then maybe you'll remember us down the road, but we yeah. all, we all need to be supporting each other. Well, let's take the, uh, the slide down uh, so that we can see your face again. Yeah, uh, terrific. Now we can see Howard. Can you say hello? So everybody can see you. Hello. How are you? All right. Good to see you. Nice to see you. I, I would imagine you have lots of art around your house. Uh, over a hundred paintings. Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> Got a little carried away, I think. <laughs> I, I'll tell. I'll tell a little story on on Howard. Um, Howard and I connected. Gosh, probably fifteen, sixteen years ago. And uh, I was trying to convince him to advertise in Plein Air magazine. And he says, well, I've got some problems with it. So we went to dinner and he went through it page by page. And we made a lot of corrections based on your advice. So thank you for that. Sure. Happy to help. Yeah. We're glad you helped. <laughs> so now I'm returning the favor. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. These are Absolutely. difficult times. <laughs> appreciate you helping getting the word out and, and spreading the word about these exhibitions that are, uh, that are happening right now. Yeah, well, I, I just want to encourage everybody to um, keep in mind, I mean, we're, we're all in this together. We're all wondering what's going to happen. We have no idea. But as you're staring in, at, in, your, in, in your house or your apartment, and you're staring at your walls, and you're thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have some new art? I'd like you to consider these guys. I think that, uh, first off, what we showed today is the contemporary side, the living artists, but the, the gallery, if you go to their website, which, what is it, raise.com? Raise.com, R-E-H-S.com, yeah. Yeah, it, you, can, you can see the, what it, the, um, the historical works as well, and you guys have always got great historical works, and I don't know how you find them, quite frankly. It must be a lot of work. How yeah, do you find them? A lot, a lot of work. Well, I think it's just that we've been around for a long time, 
and now being you know an expert on a certain number of artists uh, people come to us when they want to sell uh, but again we're very particular we get a lot of emails with a lot of offers and buy very few of them yeah well i think that matters and i think that you know you mentioned earlier lance that uh, you've sold a lot of paintings uh, by email. People don't just buy paintings from email unless they know the galleries around. They're going to trust them that that they're substantial, that they're going to be good for it. If if you know they buy it and they don't like it, you're going to take it back. That kind of a thing, and that that makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, you know, one of the things that we focus on is sort of maintaining those relationships with our collectors and, and our clients. So um, we want. We ultimately want everyone to be happy with the works that they buy from us. Um, that's that's what's most important. So, do you have any of those Todd Casey works left, or are there, there are a couple left yeah. in the show? Yeah, there's there's a few left. So, I want to I want to do props for Todd Casey real quickly. He just came out with this book. It is thick. It's a coffee table book. It is um, probably the nicest art book in my collection. I, and I'm not saying that just to to stroke Todd. It is um, probably one of the most thorough, um, well-written, beautiful images, examples. I mean, it, it just it um, raised the bar for every art book. And so uh, for the folks who are looking at Todd Casey's work, you know, his, his work is phenomenal. And you guys represent it. So that's pretty cool. So I hope you sell the rest of them. I Thank you. So Thank you. Okay. So you get, uh, you get a couple minutes to to make your, your final statement and either one of you can do it or both of you. <laughs> uh, uh, Dad, if you want to go ahead, is there anything you want to say? I have nothing specific other than I really appreciate your support. And uh, we look forward to this mess coming to an end at some point in the near future. Yeah. And I'll just say, um, you know, thank you for, for having us on and, and for doing what you're doing uh, for not just us, but for galleries in general. And, um, yeah, again, I, I really wish the best to everybody. I hope you guys stay safe and, and take this seriously. Stay inside. And um, for anybody that's sick uh, or your family's sick, uh, just hope for the best. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people are suffering and it's a very bad time. And But uh, we, we also want to remember everybody that this is a time to support uh, artists. Um, artists don't have uh, any other way to make a living in most cases. I mean, they, you know, they live from show to show or painting to painting. And, and uh, so support artists, support the people who sell the artwork, the galleries. We need them. You know, we, uh, galleries provide an important, um, important part of our world because you've got to have somebody that you can trust and know they're going to curate things well and they're not going to put just garbage on the walls, hopefully. So thank you guys. Uh, one more time for everybody's benefit. What's the website? Uh, raise.com, R-E-H-S. Okay, raise.com. And since 1935 or 1930s, right? That's pretty cool. Absolutely. That's us. Yes. Well, uh, Lance, congratulations. It looks like the baton is being passed to you and you're the next generation. And no pressure, but you got to carry it on for another uh, 40 or 50 or 100 years. Yeah, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Thank you. All right, All right. thanks again. We'll see you guys. Have a Take great care. one. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.